We're live in Banjul, broadcasting for viewers in the Gambia and around the world. This is GRTS News at 2200 hours and in our top stories this evening. President Adam Obaro reveals his government's plan to invest $10 billion in the energy sector to provide electricity in every household across the country by 2025 as he embarks on his Meet the People tour. Vice President Dr. Aysir Toure participates in a virtual summit of the 17th Interministerial Conference of the South-South Corporation on Population and Development Initiatives. Four suspected criminals are under police custody awaiting possible trial after they were charged with burglary. Plus, stakeholders in civil engineering and construction business reviews and approved the work of the committee, courtesy of the Gambia Standard Bureau. Away from home, Ghana's incumbent President Nana Akafu Addo and his main rival, former President John Dramani Mahama, promises to revive the country's economy as they contest the presidency in a general election. These and much more coming ahead in the news with me by Ibrahim Champ. Many thanks for joining us. We begin this bulletin with the executive. The president, His Excellency Adam Obaro, has revealed government's plans to invest an equivalent of $10 billion in the energy sector to provide electricity for every household across the country by 2025. President Barrow was speaking at the first meeting of his Meet the People tour in SL and Lamin in the lower and upper Numi districts of the North Bank region. The meeting also saw the defection of the GDC national chairman, Dr. Sabali, and other party members to the NPP in a move that could potentially shake in the opposition party. For such an influential figure to shift allegiance to the NPP, Momo Jalo reports. The president left the Barra Ferry Terminal after receiving a colorful reception from residents of the coastal settlement. His motorcade slowly made it to SL for the first meeting of the tour. Residents from across Lower Nyomi came out in record numbers to grace the historic meeting, which was addressed by the chief of the district and other prominent local dignitaries. They all commended government for the unprecedented infrastructural projects undertaken in the North Bank region, but called for more improvements in the areas of healthcare, education and agriculture. In line with the government's commitment to youth development, they also urged the Ministry of Youth and Sports to transform the SL football field into a ministerium to empower young people. The SL meeting also witnessed the defection of the GDC national chairman, Dr. Sabali, who announced his intention to formally embrace the MPP party. His defection is seen as a major blow to the GDC, as he claims to be a founding member of the party. Speaking at the Barra rally, Dr. Sabali said he defected after seeing the unprecedented developments undertaken by President Barra and his government in the last four years. He also commended the government for its handling and response to the coronavirus outbreak, describing it as the best in the sub-region. He said government gave out food and cash support in an unprecedented move that has allowed Gambians to weather the storm. The former GDC strongman therefore urged members of the opposition to embrace the ruling NPP, saying President Barrow is development-oriented, tolerant, and well-meaning. Dr. Savali concluded by reassuring that he is now fully behind the president and his party, revealing that he will use his influence to bring more people to the NPP. The Minister of Youth and Sports, Bakari Baji, revealed that plans have been finalized to transform the SL football field into a ministerium in the next phase, whilst the Minister of Basic and Secondary Education, Claudiana Cole, challenged the community of SL to provide land for the construction of a school to meet the rising demand for enrollment. The Minister of Tourism and Culture, Hamad Nkeba, urged the people of the North Bank region to embrace the President and his party, adding that he is poised for a landslide victory in 2021. The President, His Excellency Adam Abaro, welcomed the former GDC national chairman into the MPP fold, agreeing that Dr. Sabali and his colleagues made the right decision as it would strengthen the party. Speaking about his planned development for the future, President Barrow revealed that his government will invest the equivalent of $10 billion in the energy sector to provide electricity to every household in the Gambia by 2025. Similar investments, the President added, will be made in education, health and agriculture to empower local communities reassuring that the people of Lower Nyomi will be adequately included in the package. To this end, President Barrow said the Health Ministry has secured ambulances for local communities to evacuate patients from their homes, a kind of new initiative to bring health care services closer to the people. The President, however, challenged the young people to acquire skills to be productive and employable, urging them to abandon hopes of migrating to Europe as they could make it in the Gambia. 
He urged them to seek employment in the informal sector, which is largely dominated by foreigners, adding that the long-term development of the country depends on Gambians. He finally thanked the people of Lower Nyomi for the impressive welcome, which he said has shown that the NBR. He finally thanked the people of Lower Nyomi for the impressive welcome, which he said has shown that the North Bank region supports his government and his development agenda. Mumudu Jalo, JRTS News. In another development, the Vice President, Dr. Issa Tuture, on Tuesday participated in a virtual summit of the 17th Interministerial Conference on the South-South Cooperation in Population and Development. The forum is aimed at advocating and ensuring political support and investment to address the effects of COVID-19. The forum also seeks to address the three zeros by 2030 through promotion of South-South and Triangular Cooperation. Yerayala reports. The virtual meeting was presided over by South Africa's Minister for Social Development, Lindy Zulu, the current chairperson of Partners in Population and Development Program. Officials used the platforms to stress the need for commitment in the implementation of the three zeros with a decade to the 2030 target. The Vice President, Dr. Asiti Ture, reaffirmed government's commitment to the realization of the three zeros despite the far-reaching impact of the global pandemic. She noted that the Gambia government particularly realizes ending violence against women and girls is not just a moral and human rights imperative, but a key requisite for any meaningful development to take place. On the commitment to end gender-based violence and harmful practices against women and girls by 2030, I am happy to report that in ensuring that the fundamental human rights of girls are protected and fulfilled. The Gambia became a signatory to various international human rights treaties and their corresponding instruments. Among these is the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, SIDAO, as well as the UN General Assembly Resolution for the Complete Elimination of FGMC, which the Gambia adopted in 1979, 1989, and 2012, respectively. As part of its commitment to implement the treaties and their corresponding instruments, the government legislated the Women's Act 2010 and its amendment in 2015, the Domestic Violence Act 2013, and the Sexual Offenses Act 2013. Currently, the Women's Amendment Act 2015 and the Domestic Violence Act 2013 are being further amended to include emerging issues. Theme on taking stock and looking ahead in the post-COVID-19 crisis, the forum condemned growing occurrence of sexual and gender-based violence, maternal death, and FGM. Despite the unavailability of data on the impact of the pandemic on the health system, particularly on sexual and reproductive health services in the Gambia, there are reports that during the onset of the pandemic in the Gambia, women choose to stay away from hospitals and health centers for fear of infection, confirming our assumption that the pandemic had a similar effect on sexual and reproductive health in the Gambia like it did in other countries. The government of the Gambia, under the leadership of His Excellency President Adam Abaro, places high priority on curbing the spread of the COVID-19 to minimize its impact on the health system, more specifically on sexual and reproductive health in the Gambia, and ensuring that the commitments made at the ICPD-25 conference are honored. The Vice President, Dr. Aysa Ture, outlined progress is made towards achieving the three zeros through guidance from UNFPA and appeal for more fiscal and technical support to accelerate and mobilize urgent population development needs. For GRTS News, this is Yero Jalo reporting. To some legislative matter, the National Assembly on Tuesday approved the record of votes and proceedings of Monday's session of the 2020 legislative year. This was followed by the adjournment debate of the budget speech by the Minister of Finance and Economic Affairs, Mambul Njai. I said Jata Gasama attended the sittings at the Legislative Chambers and now reports. This session of the fourth ordinary session of the National Assembly in the 2020 legislative year began with the correction and approval of record of votes and proceedings of the Monday sittings with amendments and commending the Minister of Finance and Economic Affairs for his foresight in the estimate budget for its progressive outlook, but not without urging for the proper implementation. Are we going to be approving budgets to sustain institutions, but not for the interest of the people? But again, those that we employed or appoint to be in positions to be monitored whether they are doing what they are employed or appointed to do. This followed the adjournment debate on the budget where deputies took turns to raise concerns and problems their people are facing. 
Once upon a time, I said Gambia was exporting cattle to Nigeria and Cameroon. 500 heads at one time, 1,000 heads at another. Why has that stopped? Because the growth of cattle has been hampered by water and grazing facilities. If you go to my constituency now, Willie, the whole of Willie now, all the cattle are elsewhere, not in Willie. And throughout the dry season, they spend the whole dry season in the Nyaminas. Because of what? Because of lack of water and, and grazing facilities. My road that I've been crying for, which is the right of my people to have that access, was indicated in SAB. A ten, an amount of money was mentioned for the SAB, which prompted me to support the SAB for the interest of my people. Somebody wants to talk about people, women delivering on horse cart on donkey carts going to the hospital. We might think that it shouldn't have happened in the country here. And about what we say, we might think that it should be in the up country. But do you know that communities in, in, in Congo are having the same, same issues? My communities from Kubune, Makumbaya, Galoya, Bafuloto, um, Kubariko, if those people want to go to hospital, especially now is a problem, more especially in the United States. Women delivered on the horse cart, women delivered on donkey carts. Issues ranging from environment, agriculture, traffic congestion in the greater Banjul area, and, and the low attention paid to the education sector were equally raised. Bara is key in all the revenues that are generated by the ferries. So therefore, Bara has, in all fairness, with all due consideration, to be given a portion of the resources that are generated between Bara and Banjul. If you want quality, you have to pay for it. The member for Jara East once said, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. There is still more room for improvement, especially at the uh, skill centers. I used to say that if you look at all the regions, they all have skill centers where at least youths can go and learn skill. But CRR, there is nothing. Both north and south, there is nothing. For the health sector, deputies say they want to see positive impact as the allocated amount for the sector has been increased. Um, last Saturday, when I came from the provinces, I had to escort a patient to one of the health facilities. I will not mention the facility. To one of the health facilities at an ungodly hour. It was very late. On the speaker, but to my chagrin, some of the basic, you know, drugs were not available. Drugs like PCM, Plastamol. Deputies called for attitudinal change to promote growth and development and urged the government to always consult the NAMS. Settings continue. For the news, I am Aisa Tujata Gassama. More witnesses continue to testify before the Truth Commission. The latest to testify on Tuesday was Silaba Samate regarding his arrest and detention at the former National Intelligence Agency. Janke Ture was following the proceedings and now reports. Silaba Samate, a victim of the NIA, accused of using the name of former president to sell hard drugs, has today reappeared at the Truth Commission. Continuing his ordeal before members of the Truth Commission, Samate explained how he was interrogated by state agents at the time before his severe torture, including electrocution. When I was taken to that panel room, I found two people there. I don't know these two people. They told me to stop. Even before I was able to strip, uh, they themselves came and uh, stripped me naked. So young mother, young force, I can't see the sit down come. They caught me and forcibly made me sit down in that chair. Siran bala, siran in plo kore benyo bala me anko electrical cable le bije. The chair was placed near a, a, a plug where the, 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 some electrical cables were fixed there. 
Arrested in 2010, Silaba Samate disclosed that he was forced to agree to be part of those peddling drugs using the name of the former Gambian leader, which led to his subsequent arrest and detention. The moment, according to him, was a difficult one with most torture taking place at one Lamindabo's office at the NIA complex in Banjo. Emotional Samate explains that the involvement of his child into the matter, who was at the time staying with him throughout his detention period, later led him to give up and later agreed to terms imposed by the state, which he hastily signed. <laughs> When Cham took hold of the hand of my child from my hand, he took my child upstairs. He alone came down. He told me what we want. If you refuse to do that, he will never see your child again. I said to him, okay, bring a paper. That was the time I agreed to sign this document. Because I said, well, here yeah, things will end. Part of his ordeal, the witness told the commission that lots of things happened at the NIA. The witness further explains how he assisted one Nfali at the state guard to carry boxes containing babies. According to him, the babies were allegedly taken to Kanilai for human sacrifice. He didn't mention the hospital, but he said that some women who pass away during delivery, during childbirth, during childbirth or delivery, they pick those people's babies. These babies are brought to the NIA and later picked from the NIA and they take them to Yaya Jame's place in Kanilai. For what? For a moment. Sacrifice, sacrifice. For uh, sacrifice, to sacrifice them. Next to appear before the commission was Omar Damfa, former soldier and victim of the NIA. Sittings continue tomorrow. For the news, I am Jenga Ture. Moving on, four suspected criminals are currently in police custody awaiting possible trial after they were charged with burglary. The items include four flat screen televisions from one company located around Brusubi. Babasila was at the anti-crime headquarters where the suspects are currently being detained. This is his report. The arrest and detention of these four suspects came after the police launched a surveillance and thorough investigation which led to the recovery of these six flat screen televisions which cost about half a million dollars. Explaining the circumstances leading to the recovery of these stolen items, the police spokesman ASP Lamin Jai appealed to the general public to help the police in their fight against criminals, thieves and robbery in the country to ensure a safety community. The people who own this office have been able to put up a proper security in place and so they were able to provide the police with evidence that helped the police so much in this investigation. The police have taken time to go through this evidential material, they've reviewed it and, and through that review they were able to identify the four suspects and they have spent the whole night rounding them up from one spot to the other until all of them have been arrested. So far so good, all the flat screen televisions that they have stolen have all been recovered and those are the ones that you have seen outside there. Many of the suspects in custody, according to the police anti-crime officials, are habitual offenders who have been known for the same crimes since the formation of the unit. Many a time people say these people are repeated offenders. Yes, they may be repeated offenders, but that will not stop the police from re-arresting them and putting them before the court of law. And the fines and sentences that they get there is another um, institution, so which is the judiciary. And so we may not be able to uh, determine that, but we can always be out there to ensure that we patrol, we arrest, and we prosecute. We want to let the public understand that these people who have been arrested have all been charged with breaking and stealing. They've also been charged with 
conspiracy to commit felony, and some of them have been charged with um, receiving of stolen property as well as accessory to the fact. And so all this um, um, situation right now is under the purview of the police anti-crime unit. The files have been reviewed and they are getting ready um, to put them before the court as soon as possible. The suspect, according to the police spokesperson, will be arraigned any time before a competent court of law for prosecution on charges of conspiracy, breaking and stealing, among other criminal charges. For JRTS News, I am Baba Silla. Away from that, the Gambia Standard Bureau on Tuesday organized a Civil Engineering and Construction Materials Technical Committee meeting to approve a draft CSEBS standards held at its head office in Kotu. The event brought together different stakeholders to review and approve the work by the committee. Kajeta Jawara tells us more. The Gambian Standard Bureau was established by an Act of Parliament in 2010 as a body meant to standardize methods and products produced or consumed in the country. Speaking at the opening ceremony, the Director General of Standard Bureau, Papa Seka, noted that the meeting will significantly enhance the skills of the Bureau's subcommittee members. Among all the technical committees that we have had, or the subcommittees dealing with uh, a variety of issues, this particular one dealing with uh, stabilized compressed earth blocks, it's really very pertinent simply because in the last um, um, regional tour that we had, we just completed uh, about a week ago, it became very clear that its use will be immediately um, uh, of need by the communities that we visited. The Director of Standardization Division, Ibrahim Musa Jalo, pointed out that the Bureau has received a request from the International Trade Center to develop the public six technical specification standards for compressed art blocks. And one of the standards, uh, Mr. Chairman, they developed from scratch. There was no reference material, there was no reference standard. They have to develop the standard from scratch. In fact, that's what has delayed us more. Um, using um, available laboratories in the country here, I also thank those institutions that uh, were able to provide us those um, facilities to be able to conduct some of the analysis that is needed to develop the standards. Adding that the Bureau has also constituted a subcommittee to review the compressed earth blocks technical specification standards. Gumworks Senior Project Assistant Khadija Tu Fofana said it is part of her organization's top priorities to collaborate with other partner agencies, stakeholders for the development of the country. This is all a part of national de development. Uh, many of the countries have already developed standards and um, Gambia needs to be on board with it because as we stand now, everything is standardized and um, Gambia is developing. Uh, we need to move into the developed phase. And in order for us to do that, we need to maintain our standards and respect them. According to Madam Fofana, the meeting will go a long way in promoting and maintaining the technical committee's consideration of comments and approval of the draft document. Reporting for GRTS News, I am Khadija Tujuwara. The Network Against Gender-Based Violence is on their second leg of campaign against gender-based violence. The outreach program is aimed at sensitizing local authorities and members of the community to dialogue in ending G GBV. As we hear in this report by Fatu Diba, the delegation comprises of government and civil society organizations. Caravan began their tour at the Lower River Region Governor's Office in Mansa, Congo. There, the team's demand includes the allocation of funding and formulation of policies that will protect employees and the people within the region from any form of violence and harassment. Women counselors and social workers within the region highlighted rape as one of the many abuses women and girls encounter. We've discussed this issue during our sittings. We are trying to find means of ending gender-based violence in our communities and regions. It's a dual responsibility, both as us as leaders in our different fields, and even as parents, 
as people managing homes, as even members of the society, to play our individual role. I can just read from the justice uh, rep here, say that even by witnessing an act that is violating the right of the girl child in terms of the FGM, you are not reporting the case, you are guilty of an offense. And the law is also going to lay hands on you. The Women's Amendment Act 2015 banned FGM and the Children's Act putting a ban on violation of rights of children, such as early marriage. The representative of the Ministry of Justice, Renata Jack, sensitized the communities on the penalties for some of these crimes. <laughs> It is prohibited for any parent or guardian to give out a child's hand in marriage, even with the child's consent. A child is a child and might not be able to make the right decisions. So if you have a child, you can force it. You can say at that age, you can say that you can say that you can say that. From the lower river region, the visiting team proceeded to the northern part of the central river region, reaching out to the community of Balangar where they emphasize the need to put an end to gender-based violence. Both the boy and girl child need to be sensitized. Women have suffered a lot. Every parent wants their children to become what they desire. The talk continues as the team reached out to local authorities and communities to advocate for the elimination of gender-based violence and has well created awareness on its harmful effects and punishment for perpetrators. Fatu Diba, for GRTS News. Young Men's Christian Association, the Gambia, converged in Kanifing for a two-day conference on civic responsibility and participation. The forum brought together young people to discuss peace building ahead of the 2021 electoral cycle. The program, as Osmani reports, forms part of YMCA Finland's supported project, which runs out by end of 2020. And participation organized by YMCA. The two-day conference caps of the YMCA Finland project aiming to enhance the understanding of young people ahead of the 2021 election in the country. In her welcome remarks, the program director YMCA, Priscilla H.D. Don, noted that the Work for Peace project funded by YMCA Finland empowers young people to build their capacities on civic education. Our YMCA peacemakers make up very passionate youth who are so eager to lead changes in their communities and promote peaceful relationships. As peacemakers, one of their niche has been to engage the youthful populace against the irregular migration, using their personal stories to provide first-hand information about the dangers of the irregular migration and its prevention. We continue to reach out to our three targeted regions, Greater Banji area, West Coast region, and Lower River region, with our aim to positively impact the lives of youth in the Gambia, thus improving their social economic status. The National General Secretary, YMCA, John Sinjai, explained that his organization is committed to empowering young people in contributing to the growth of the country and not to be as subjects of political and development actors. What we aim to do at the YMCA is to move young people from being subjects to become active citizens. Citizens that are going to contribute towards the welfare of their communities and welfare of their nations. We want to give young people a voice. We want you to be empowered with skills. We want you to be empowered economically. We want you to have space to speak. So when you speak, the people around you will listen. In his keynote speech, the Chairman National Human Rights Commission, Emmanuel Diju, while advocating for the promotion and protection of individual human rights, urged young people to be agents of change towards nation building. We may need to deny line, need to add a line, but we have this propensity to be evil. But I think as a population, as a youthful population, it is our job to make sure that we take our responsibilities seriously and that we bring in a culture where we accept each other regardless of our tribes and our religion. And I think this is what we should talk about in our little communities. Let us talk to each other and make sure that it, this Gambia we have is the Gambia that we will all grow up, your children will grow up. Participant Mustafa Sonko 
highlighted the role of youths in ensuring peace and security in the country. To the 2021 election that is coming, it is looming, and then you know there are lines that have already been drawn. Youths are the people that vote. They are very energetic. When it comes to problem, youths are always part of it. So what we want to say here, a message that we want to send here is, if there is problem, don't be part of the problem. Be part of the solution because this country belongs to us. We should respect each other's political difference, religious difference, at ethnic difference. Participants are expected to be exposed to the ways to achieve peace and security, focusing on social change as well as civic education towards the promotion of peace building. Usman Mane, GRTS. The community of Burfoot Dar es Salaam are rejoicing over the installation of a solar power water borehole donated by Tabor Welfare Foundation in UK. The borehole seeks to address the challenges faced in accessing clean drinking water in the village since its establishment. Well, GRT has visited the Kumbo settlement of Burfoot Dar es Salaam and here's the details. Within the outskirts of Burfoot resides this settlement with less than a thousand inhabitants called Burfoot Dar es Salaam. According to the Alcalo of the village, the community did not have electricity supply, neither does it have pipe-borne water since its establishment. Instead, they have been using water from the well, which is said to be contaminated. According to the Alcalo, access to the village has also been a challenge due to the poor roads. The villagers also stated that the Quranic school built for the kids has been raised to the ground, thus forcing the school to relocate in the mosque. Thanks to Taiba Welfare Foundation, Friends of the late Marhum Maram Khushim from Saudi Arabia who sponsored the erection of a solar-powered water borehole to salvage the excruciating pain of fetching water by the community. This borehole uh, started when it came to our notice that this uh, uh, community is a vulnerable community. They needed some water. Um, fortunately, um, uh, at that moment, Taiba Welfare Foundation was able to um, uh, carry out this project. Dama Sisi, who established the village, recalled how women suffered to acquire water just to be able to execute their daily chores. The Imam of the Quranic School hailed the donors for providing them a solar-powered water borehole pump that can pump at least 12,000 liters daily. Visiting few of the households, we spoke to Jaina Basani and Farman Amani on what life was like for them before the advent of the borehole. We faced many challenges. We have no water or electricity. Sometimes our well runs dry. But still we are appealing to Nawek if they can come to our support. Though you now we have, uh, they lay some pipe from the village going to uh, Madiana, but uh, still it's not enough. To get uh, water in, in your own compound sometimes, you know, is, is, is also a, an issue. The donation of a solar-powered borehole by Taiba Welfare Foundation is the first step towards addressing the multiple challenges faced by communities in this tiny settlement of Burfoot Dar es Salaam. Reporting for GRTS News, I'm by Ibrahim Chan. The Kaaba Fita Class of 1993 and Ex-Students Association of Birkama recently presented medical and surgical equipment worth of £150,000 to the Ministry of Health at a ceremony held at the Central Medical Stores in Kotu. The ceremony was attended by health officials, members of the Kabafita Class of 1993, and Ex-Students Association, as well as officials at the Birkama Area Council. Aysa Rajate Gassama reports. The medical items worth over 150000 will hugely boost and improve healthcare service delivery during a global pandemic that has entered a difficult second wave. Central Medical Stores is known to be the hub of the Ministry of Health for receiving and redistribution of all medical and drugs for the Gambia. And we are very happy to receive the donors from Kabafita class 93 who are here today with us to give a very magnificent donation to the Minister of Health. It's the work of a UK-based medical philanthropist who has committed himself to supporting the health sector amid a critical crisis still raging around the world. Badia, like Aliu had said, 
Suleiman Sanyang is part of us. He's also um, a, an ex-student of Kabafita Primary School Class 93. And he's been doing this for the past 10 years, and it's been successful. So we said, why not we help um, Suleiman? But since the, um, the association wasn't registered, then we decided to register it as a non-profit organization. This charity has rendered constant support to the Birkama District Hospital and other health centers in the West Coast region. The latest consignment prioritized the Birkama District Hospital, whose commitment to service delivery for a massive catchment area is attracting more support from community members coming to give back to their country and people. Health is everyone's business. And without a quality or a good health, no society can make any headway. So this donation was born out of humanitarian gesto. When we all sick, we all go to our local hospitals. So having this small, when we are opportunity enough to go out of the country, what we can do is to reflect back our minds to the poor and needy that are in our community. The donated items include maternal and labor equipment, surgical items, and laboratory gear, amongst others. For Badi, yeah, they have been with us for a long time. We have been partnering with them, although it's not, uh, uh, we are trying for it not to be a parasitic relationship, but uh, they have been helping us a lot during the past 10 years. And then uh, for Badi yeah, group, in, in the uh, leadership of Mr. Sanyang, we thank you all, we thank you for your continuous support that you are giving to Brikama District Hospital. Beneficiaries gave strong assurance that the donated medical items will be put to good use. Health officials commended the donors' efforts, noting that government cannot do it all alone. We are grateful that the citizens of Gambia have taken it upon themselves to contribute what they can to the efforts of the government towards the health needs of the of their fellow Gambians. For that, we commend Kabafita Primary School Class of 93 and their partners, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde in Scotland, and Project Gambia for such a noble, a, a noble gesture. The donated medical items are meant to be distributed to all hospitals in the country as officials move to tackle a potential second beef that could put the country back in lockdown. For the news, I am Aisa Tujata Gassama. Time now to take our first break. We'll be back with news from outside the Gambia. Do stay with us. Consumers need service providers, and service providers are there because there are consumers. Regarding to the network issues, it is a concern and it's a problem to everybody. Are you looking for help from Pura or do you want Navek to make a public commitment here in front of everyone? Navek and Pura to help me solve this once and for all. Two and a half years is a long time. Don't, don't go to Pura, come to Nawek. No, Nawek will solve your problem. The Kelasi Bitule, Til Tandim Pula, December 2020. Sadawra Kairaba Jawra International Conference Center, Tarantan Sumunda, Katapa Talawar, Pura. Halor in Kendekele, Taloko Kemoli. Well, an interesting uh, convergence that will be, but welcome back. We begin in West Africa, where Ghana's incumbent president, Anana Akafo Addo, and his main rival, former president, John Dramani Mahama, are contesting for the presidency in a general election. Each candidate has offered assurances of reviving the economy while, whilst following its first contraction in nearly 40 years. In total, 12 presidential candidates are in the race, with most voters likely to settle for either Addo and his new patriotic party or Mahama's National Democratic Congress. For more on the elections in Ghana, CGTN's Nabil Ahmed Rufai reports. The turnout has been good so far. Um, polling started at exactly 7 uh, a.m. local time across the polling stations. Here at this particular polling station, you can see that things are very, very calm. Uh, you can see a lot of uh, people queuing to cast their ballot. 
what it means is that early in the morning there were a lot of people here some even spent the night here in order to be the first among the first people to cast their ballots so generally we can say that it's been quite a peaceful um, I mean elections and the turnout has been great so far the fact that the electoral commission made today a public holiday meant that a lot of people would come to the polling stations to cast their ballots well a lot is at stake for Ghana in terms of solidifying its I mean position as a leader in democracy within the West Africa sub-region. So this particular election is a test for Ghana to also make sure that it comes out victorious in terms of ensuring that there is peace after the election without any post-election violence. So it's very, very critical, especially for the Electoral Commission, to ensure a free and fair election that everybody, every party participating in this particular election would accept. So there's a lot at stake, although the two contenders, the former president John Mahama and the current president um, Nana Kupado, have signed a peace deal um, to send a signal that they would accept the results of the Electoral Commission when it's announced it within the next 24 hours. And if they feel like it's credible, then, then um, they would just, uh, I, I mean, accept the results. So it's once again a test case for Ghana to solidify itself as a leader in terms of uh, democracy within the West Africa sub-region and it's something that the entire country is hoping to achieve. In Nigeria, like the rest of Africa, there have been a long conversation around the equality for the girl child. Despite government's efforts to close the gap between boys and girls, the gains have remained inadequate. In a report from the advocacy group African Child Policy Forum, indicates the prevalence of discrimination amongst girls and equality. Details in the CTN report. Hildatu Abdullahi is from northern Nigeria, a predominantly patriarchal society. Females face cases of forced child marriages, female genital mutilation, sexual abuse and exclusion from education. But Hildatu didn't want to be a conventional northern Nigerian girl child. She was bent on completing her education, building a career for herself, and choosing her own life partner. So she fled her home when her family tried forcing her into an unwanted marriage. In the Hausa community, they feel getting married is like a huge achievement for you. And when a man gets married to you, it's like he's doing a favor, and which is very wrong. When you talk about being successful, you want to open a shop, you want to do this, you want to do that. The first question they try to ask you is, are you not going to get married? You're planning all this, when are you going to get married? Some parents will even stop their children from, from, from going further, from achieving more success. Hildatu was lucky enough to find a new path. But there are millions of girls from her region and across the African continent who aren't as lucky. A new report released by an advocacy group the African Child Policy Forum shows that girls are condemned to a lifetime of discrimination and inequality. There are about 308 million girls under the age of 18 in Africa, yet only one in five of them had access to secondary school. Despite government's effort to close the inequality gap, much more is required from other key players. I think we have left this responsibility to the government alone and we know that government cannot do everything. Government can only give us policies, it can only give us framework. It's now left for CSOs, CBOs, NGOs to go to the... Well, that's all we have for you in this news bulletin, but here's a quick recap of our top stories. President Adam Obaro has revealed his government's plan to invest $10 billion in the energy sector to provide electricity in every household across the country by 2025. This as he embarked on his Meet the People tour in the North Bank region. Vice President Dr. Issa Tuture has participated in a virtual summit of the 17th Interministerial Conference of the South-South Cooperation on Population and Development Initiatives. Four suspected criminals are under police custody awaiting possible trial after they were charged with burglary. Plus, stakeholders in civil engineering and construction business have been reviewing the work of the committee, courtesy of the Gambia Standard Bureau. Away from home, Ghana's incumbent President Nana Akafo Addo and his main rival, former President John Dramani Mahama, have promised to revive the country's economy as they contest the presidency in a general election. Well, that was all we had in this edition of GRTS News. Many thanks for the pleasure of your company. Please enjoy the rest of our programs.